What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are covering Umbrella Academy, which is something that you guys have been asking for for a long time. <laughs> and it's kind of astounding that it took us this long to cover, but of course the show comes back on June 22nd. Uh, so we're gonna cover Umbrella Academy volume one, two, and three back to back, right? So today, tomorrow, and the day after. And then volume three, actually the Hotel Oblivion is where you start getting into the sparrows. So here's the thing. Volume one is very similar to what you guys saw in the Netflix series. I mean, there's huge differences as there usually are between the comics and TV shows, movies, different things like that. But this initially opens up with basically the Eiffel Tower going crazy, <laughs> right? I mean, you do have like the, the kids who are born from the Umbrella Academy and they're adopted by Reginald Hargreaves and that kind of stuff. That origin story doesn't really change that much in the TV show. It's still basically the same. Uh, but the whole thing about this is that the idea of the Umbrella Academy, at least at this point in time, is still relatively new. People don't really know why Reginald Hargreaves adopted them. We're not really given an explanation as to why he did that. And nobody really knew what their purpose was, aside from the fact that they were just kind of a group of kids who were born with powers and they do stuff. And that was basically it. But essentially it starts off with what appears to be a guy being being thrown off the Eiffel Tower only for the Umbrella Academy to show up. And then rumor essentially saying like, I heard a rumor that like, basically like this museum in Paris is giving away all their paintings. So everybody's gonna go and rob the place essentially. Like they're just gonna go rob the joint. So now they gotta find a way to get those paintings back once this is done. But of course it gets everybody out of the area. The bigger issue with this is of course, it turns out it really was the Eiffel Tower that seemingly threw this guy off of itself. And you do get a bit of a moment, right? Where Yanya's kind of told by Reginald Hargreaves that like she's not important, right? She's not really special. That kind of a thing that's one thing that i do want you guys to be aware of is that those moments in the show that basically had a lot of attention being given to them in the comics they happen like that right it happened in the blink of an eye um they were there was nowhere near the level of significance now that's because you're talking about a storyline that ran for about two seasons as opposed to this one which happens in about one issue or so i mean technically it's six six issues in the story but not nearly as much room to craft a lot of the character development that you saw in the uh, umbrella academy show but the thing about this is of course they end up basically finding out that the eiffel tower is basically being controlled by zombie robot gustave eiffel right like just this crazy French mad scientist guy. And so he's ultimately taken out by Kraken. You guys might recall him as the guy who's really good with knives. Uh, basically he's taken out by him. And then of course, Hargreaves tells the kids that the Eiffel Tower is not really the Eiffel Tower, that it's actually a ship. And then it just takes off. And that's basically it, <laughs> right? That's kind of the crazy thing. Again, this brief little moment here. Now, what you end up doing is jumping forward by about 20 years. And of course you end up picking up with Luther, the guy who had his head grafted to the body of an ape or is part man, part ape, what have you. And of course, much like the TV show, it's kind of on the moon where he gets the phone call that Reginald Hargreaves had died. Now, the thing about this, and this is where things really begin to change in terms of the differences between the comics and the show, is that you pick up with Yanya, who of course did write that book that was kind of a tell-all about the Umbrella Academy, how terribly she was treated as a member of the Umbrella Academy, but also how it was that Reginald Hargreaves just didn't really seem to care about any of them, but she's greeted with a mysterious phone call where they essentially tell her, like, we know you're more special than you've been led to believe. Meet us at this theater at noon tomorrow, right? The Icarus Theater, and we'll kind of take it from there, right? We'll explain everything that's going on. And so the rest of this largely deals with essentially Luther showing up to uh, to the, the Umbrella Academy itself and coming to terms with the fact of of course, meeting with uh, with Pogo, but coming to terms with the fact that Hargreaves really is dead. The kicker here is that number five had disappeared some time before. He kind of vanished during this 20 year period and we didn't really know what was going on there. The funny thing here is that once he reappears, of course, it's the ominous message, the world is going to end, right? The world as we know it is going to simply cease to exist. And so that's kind of the crazy thing is that once Luther wakes up the following morning, that he's basically met by the arrival of Rumor. Now, one of the funny things is that in the show, there was almost this kind of, as strange as it sounds, romantic tension between Luther and Rumor. That's not really a main focal point here. Uh, it's kind of there, not necessarily though. It's not really something that's, that's readily built on when it comes to this. In a lot of ways, I wouldn't go as far as to say that Luther sort of ignores rumor, but his priorities are elsewhere. And we'll kind of talk about that as we as we sort of get further through this. Of course, the seance shows up as well, and he actually has a big caveat when it comes to this comic, which is really, really cool. But the seance basically shows up, and between the three of them, we learn pretty quickly there's not really a lot of love loss for Reginald Hargreaves, right? There's not really a lot of people, you know, no one's really sad about the fact that Hargreaves has died. Now, one of the crazy things that goes on here <laughs> is that these robots seemingly just kind of spring to life, right? Like literally these 
they look like little popcorn bots, but they kind of spring to life and basically attack a carousel, just incinerate it and take out like nine kids. So that's kind of nuts. Uh, but then what that does is it kind of jumps to number five in him jumping into the future. Now, again, that's why I say there are big differences here. One of the benefits of it having a Netflix series is that they were able to kind of fill in the cracks, whereas in the comics, you just jump from one moment to the next. In the in the Netflix series, they were able to kind of provide that transition, right? So again, some, some pretty big differences. But as most of you guys probably already know with the whole thing about number five is that he had just kind of been experimenting with time travel. And of course he was warned by Reginald Hargreaves, don't travel too, too far forward in time because you can't travel back in time. And ultimately he ended up doing that, right? He basically just jumped forward through the time stream to the point where it was basically him coming to the realization the world had come to an end. Now, initially, because he hated basically being bossed around and that kind of a thing initially he reveled in this idea right he's the only person left alive in this world celebrated it so on and so forth but as time began to pass he began to experience what it was really like to be on his own right it's one of those things be careful what you ask for you just might get it and that's really what happened right he wanted to just be left alone so ultimately he ended up in a place where he was alone now he also ended up stumbling across the book that was written by number seven right written by yana that kind of had this tell-all about the umbrella academy and so for really the first time he actually is able to look at the entire group from the outside looking in now at the time he's also 10 years old so he sees the world the way a 10 year old does but as the years begin to pass and as time goes on his recollection and his revelation understanding how the umbrella academy truly functioned at the very least from the eyes of of number seven gives him this perception that he didn't readily have before that not all that glitters is gold not only that being so isolated and being alone gives him a desire to go back to, to when he had essentially disappeared. And so for 50 years, he's literally there just trying to figure out a way to travel back into the past. One of the things that had happened, again, kind of off panel in the comics, but was basically explored in the Netflix series, is that he ended up basically talking to what was essentially a mannequin, named her Dolores and everything, right? I mean, it's the only real way for a person to maintain their sanity in that environment is to essentially fabricate friends. And of course, Dolores kind of chimes in and says, well, you you screwed up the math equation, right? You messed it up like 12 years ago. Didn't really have the heart to tell you, but uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of why you weren't able to get back. <laughs> and so ultimately, once he solves the equation, he's able to jump back. The problem here is instead of arriving at the moment he disappeared, you know, during this 20 year period, he basically ends up arriving in the present in this moment right now basically later than he was supposed to show up and so as a result of that there's a little bit of speculation but no one really digs too deep into this it's kind of like well maybe Hargreaves death is what caused it and it's like maybe I don't know but the important thing here is the world's gonna end in like three days so we need to basically find a way to stop that from happening and that's really it right and so what you end up getting is of course everybody kind of being there for the funeral of Hargreaves and even mother shows up right you guys recall her from the TV show but the reality here is Kraken is really the one that harbors more animosity than anybody else and a lot of that just really seems to come down to the fact that there just wasn't a whole lot of concern for him from Reginald Hargreaves now again a lot of that character development kind of being left out here one of the benefits of having volume two which is Dallas and then volume three which is the Hotel Oblivion is a lot of that stuff is expanded on you do get some information later on down the line in terms of how it was that Hargreaves had basically treated everybody, why it is that they have so much animosity for him, different things along those lines. But the reality is that unlike a kind of loving father that would take their children and ensure that their children lived a, a kind of meaningful life, being there for them in different ways, right? Emotionally and probably spiritually on some level, kind of providing them and guiding them in the world, that in a lot of ways, Hargreaves was just neglectful in the sense that as long as what they wanted to do didn't get in the way of his plan, they were free to do it. But if a choice had to be made between them wanting to go live a life for themselves or craft their own life and what it was that Hargreaves wanted to do, their choices amounted to nothing. It was largely just ignored or they were ignored or their whole voice was basically shut down. And so they're, they're, you know, the, the Umbrella Academy kids are really an answer to the question, what happens when you're a child who's raised by a father that basically ignores your own desires, only focuses on what it is that he wants by all standards of measurement, what you or I would call a narcissist, and then they grow into adulthood, right? They harbor animosity for you and that's why kraken does things like humiliate mother and then just kind of like i mean like obviously she's not really our mother as we know her she's just a robot who was kind of there and like did some stuff but like she was no measure of a mom a lot of anger is basically being held out here now the truth about it is that kraken's lashing out that's really all that it is right i mean he's just lashing out at everybody around him because he's filled with anger and hate he just can't really get it out in a constructive way but what it does is it switches over to the icarus theater now again this is a big 
big difference. That what you have here is an invitation for Yanya to basically play for everybody. And she plays pretty well, but it's also been a long time. She ends up you know, breaking one of the strings on a violin. But of course, when the lights go off and she's shown the crowd that she's playing to, you basically get a really eccentric kind of guy where he refers to them as basically the orchestra uh, vertimat is really what he says. And he's like, I'm the conductor, i.e. the leader of this whole thing. And we've written something called the Apocalypse Suite. We want to bring the world to an end, essentially using a person that has powers that could essentially help us accomplish that. The problem is no one else is up to the task except for you, right? You're the only person whose powers or whose, whose abilities are tied directly into music uh, so you can essentially help us in the world. Is there a lot of logic and reason to this? No, but it's a comic book. Who cares? And so the result of that is, of course, she basically shoots down the idea, right? I mean, she's like, I don't want to have anything to do with this notion of like destroying the world, like leave me alone. And so where initially the orchestra goes after her, the response to the conductor is no, let her go, right? She's obviously going to go meet with her family. She's going to find her family doesn't really have any interest in her whatsoever for no other reason than the fact they've been conditioned to believe that. And uh, then we'll call it a day, right? She'll end up coming back here. And so what you end up doing is switching over to the rest of the team showing up to basically this carnival and trying to bring an end to it all. Now, we are given a little bit of a background here by Gerard Way, where we essentially found out that at some previous point in time, that rumor had been kidnapped by a guy named Dr. Terminus, who basically eats things, <laughs> right? Almost kind of has like this insatiable Galactus type hunger for those of you guys who are coming from, from Marvel Comics, but he can basically just consume seemingly everything and almost endlessly. And so his desire was to basically just wreak havoc, right? To kind of villain, destroy the world, that sort of a thing. And of course, where rumor is saved by the other members of the Umbrella Academy, she'd kind of frozen up because of those experiences. And that's kind of how it is for her here, right? That while she is able to use her powers in this moment, she freezes. And of course it leads to the rest of the Umbrella Academy trying to tell her to get it together and that kind of a thing. And for the most part, the day's kind of saved to a degree, but in the midst of this great big huge fight, you have Yanya who comes to the realization the carnival's on fire. She shows up because she knows that essentially her family's gonna be there as well. Of course, popping the pills, that basically keep her powers shut down, the ones that she was conditioned to take when she was a little kid. And so, of course, what you get is her basically arriving on the scene and actually running into Kraken. And so the crazy thing is that when she meets him, Kraken lashes out. He's like, why would you show your face here? Like, why would you appear here, right? Like, literally, you, you took off. You abandoned the entirety of the family, right? So again, these kind of rifts that had taken place over the course of, of the previous 20 years that led to them going their own ways that aren't necessarily explored here, but they're rifts nonetheless. Now, a lot of this seems to be rooted, even though Gerard Way doesn't give us like a definitive explanation of this, a lot of this seems to be rooted in the fact that with Reginald Hargreaves ignoring them and Mother really being a robot that didn't necessarily feel like a mother, all they had was each other. And that by whatever manner and whatever means, their lives had taken them in different directions. And so each one of them kind of felt abandoned in their own way. And Kraken holding the most animosity out of everybody else is just kind of like, you took off, right? You abandoned the family. Why would you show back up after all? All of these years. We don't want your help. We don't need your help. You're absolutely useless. You have no powers. The only thing that you're going to do by being here is get somebody killed. You know, he even goes as far as to say, I used to think that I had a sister, but I've got absolutely nobody. And in pushing her away like that, of course, she takes off. And when everybody else shows up, he's like, oh, just a random citizen. It doesn't really matter. And is dismissive of the whole thing. Of course, this sends Yanya right back into the arms of the orchestra. Now, one of the things that had happened here is that in her absence, and what the orchestra had been doing for quite some time is basically kidnapping violinists with the intention of trying to see if they could find a way to help them in the world. Whenever one of them demonstrated they were incapable of doing it, which was essentially everybody, they would just execute them and then, you know, drag them off and call it a day. But of course, Yanya comes back exactly as the conductor said she would and says, let's give them a performance that they'll never forget. So one of the things to notice here is that the way in which Gerard Way tells this story is very fast and loose. This is not one of those great big huge things. I mean, honestly, he could have stretched this out for like a 12 issue volume and given us a lot more development than we got. But the truth about it is that it was just Gerard Way's method of telling stories. He's one of those guys where he just kind of cuts through all what you, know, what, what you could argue to be unnecessary stuff and really kind of leaves it to us as the audience 
to kind of fill in the blanks for ourselves and then just sort of go forward from there. So it really is intriguing in terms of how this works. Now, regarding the entirety of this orchestra itself, one of the things they do is, of course, they take her off her meds because that basically suppresses her abilities. The next thing they do is they literally start going through the journal of Reginald Hargreaves, which they'd access through the black market. And the fact that Reginald Hargreaves had actually revealed she's the most dangerous out of all the members of the Umbrella Academy. It's why it is that Hargreaves always told her she never had powers and it's why she was conditioned to take meds to keep her powers basically suppressed because if she were to use her powers which seemingly she didn't have the ability to control she could actually end the world and so instead of teaching her to use her powers she was just taught that she didn't have any which is pretty screwed up when you think about it right it's almost just guaranteeing a recipe for disaster right like i'm afraid she's going to end the world so i will instigate or, or initiate a series of events that will basically end the world right that's really kind of how it is not intentionally but that's still kind of being the case the result of this is that you basically pick up with her kind of being conditioned by the orchestra almost kind of going crazy but not necessarily right she doesn't really lose her mind and unlike what you saw when it came to the tv show it wasn't necessarily that she was completely and totally dominated by abandonment for her family in a lot of ways it's her just kind of letting loose and just kind of doing her thing tapping into this level of power she didn't know she had before so while one part of this equation is the fact that she did feel abandoned by her family the other part of it is she's kind of discovering herself for the first time in terms of what it is that she can do so it's almost as though her the, the the grief and the pain that she's endured that was never fully treated is all just coming to the surface in this weird and somewhat chaotic way and everything's starting to pop off and so that's when she's introduced to the rest of the orchestra as the white violin right kind of the not really the leader but a member who's going to lead them into what's basically the apocalypse that this orchestra full of just crazy people has essentially been creating and so when she's told give us a demonstration of your power the first thing she does is kill the conductor <laughs> and then immediately take over the entirety of the orchestra and say like i will bring you the end of the world that you want like follow my lead and we will bring an end to it all the first thing we're going to do though is we're going to kill the umbrella academy and so that leads to her basically showing up on the doorstep of the umbrella academy itself and just unleashing holy hell right literally just smashing the door off this place now the other part of this this is one of the things that's a little more interesting here is you do have this rooftop meeting between the rumor and luther where the two of them kind of talk and that sort of thing but one of the things to know is that unlike the show where you get a lot of backstory about the rumor and you really get not necessarily a super in-depth explanation about her personal life you get more there than you do here that the only thing that you're really told here is that the husband of rumor had basically filed for divorce something like eight months ago and that there is a bit of concern you know kind of worry or, or possibly some measure of anxiety on behalf of rumor where she's like i wonder if you know my daughter claire is spending time with you know my ex or with my ex's new girlfriend or something like that but not a whole lot that goes on there one of the things that is intriguing though and again this kind of speaks to the idea that this sort of romantic sexual tension that was really built on in the netflix series didn't necessarily exist here is that luther starts talking to to rumor but doesn't necessarily go super in depth into like her personal life and in fact he actually starts focusing on their powers right like you know i noticed you didn't really use your powers when we were in that great big huge conflict in like the carnival did you lose them or something like that and of course in her frustration about the fact that she's divulging this part of herself to luther and his only real focus is on like their abilities their roles that kind of a thing that one of the things to, to notice is that much like the show luther is almost trying to impress a man that doesn't exist anymore right trying to impress a dead guy and so because of that she calls him out on it and it's like really like i'm literally spilling my life out to you here my concerns and fears and worries and your focus is on your powers but then you get this really sentimental moment from luther where he kind of chimes in and says but it's all i have well i mean like look at me like i'm a i'm a i'm i'm a human head attached to like a mars ape body right like i mean look at this like who would want to sleep with me like who would want to form a family with me like that life is over for me the only way i've ever been able to find any measure of solace in this life that i live is to focus on my powers is to focus on my role as a superhero there's nothing else for me in this world besides that you know and so that's one of the things where he tells tells rumor like you have that opportunity you know and so use this right like if this is the role that we have use your powers to help us save the world you know do it for claire and he's like i'd like to meet her someday and so that kind of gentle nature that he gives her that he shows rumor that's when rumor makes the move and says you know i heard a rumor that you've wanted to kiss me since you were eight years old and so that's when it kind of 
kicks in and he ends up making out with her, which is kind of weird. Making out with his adopted sister, a little strange to me, but that's one of the things is it's not an over, it's not a heavy handed concept in the comics. It's not a major focal point. And in fact, it's not really much of a point at all. It's not really something that exists there. It's not really until this moment that you actually realize that maybe there was some kind of romantic connection between the two. Now, the fact that she used her powers on, uh, on you know, Luther kind of indicates he was sort of coerced into it, right? It's not really of his own accord, but nonetheless, right? It's just one of those things where it's kind of like, okay, you know, where she tells him that she's scared and where you would normally expect him having been forced in that position to rebuke her. Instead, he actually embraces her. And so again, there really did seem to be some kind of rom a romantic connection between the two, albeit unexplored. And so again, with, uh, you know, switching back to, to Yanya showing up on the doorstep of the Umbrella Academy, of course, she destroys the entrance to the place, right? Sets the whole place on fire and then kills Pogo, right? So that's kind of nuts. And where you did have initially a moment where number five, it kind of passed out due to a vision that he was experiencing, right? Kind of sending his mind into the past a little bit to see Pogo, at least only for a moment, albeit something that was never fully explored. When he wakes back up, of course, he finds that basically the entire place has been blown to pieces. Is Pogo's dead, and it all seemed to have been done by Yanya. And so that's when they come to the realization she's the one that's going to end the world. And so, of course, what you get is them showing up on the scene, and you get a bit of a, a fight that goes on here, but this is where you start to get into what's going on. That unlike the Netflix show, where, where Yanya was really more hellbent by rage and anger and pain, that now it looks as though she's kind of transitioned to what looks like utter madness, to the point that she actually taunts Kraken, right? Where Kraken has a knife to her throat, you know, and he's like, why wouldn't I kill you? She's like, well, I mean, you know, because I love you and because I know you won't and then basically strums her instrument and sends a guy flying off you know into like a wall or something like that so again where the show had a lot more drama this comic has a little more comedy to it it's more dark humor than anything else, but it feels a lot more lighthearted than the actual TV show did. So again, just differences in tone and differences in terms of how things are handled. Now, of course, with the rest of the Umbrella Academy showing up here on the scene, then you ultimately have, you know, Yanya who slices the throat of, uh, of Rumor, so she can't talk, so she can't use her power. She sends a portion of the orchestra, those individuals who have a kind of break, you know, from the, the performance, sends them after the Umbrella Academy. And of course, a great big, huge fight breaks out between all of them. And things are pretty straightforward there. That what you end up getting is basically what looks like Reginald Hargreaves' younger self showing up here on the scene and basically talking to Yanya. Now, the funny thing is that Yanya initially believes that it's Seance. And of course, he, you know, Reginald Hargreaves responds, no, like, it's me, just a younger version of me. But like, this, this, what you're performing here in this orchestra is a sham, right? Like, I've got the guy who created this whole thing, who created, like, like this famous composer who created this. He brought a whole bunch of younger kids to actually perform it correctly. And by throwing her off guard that way, right, where he initially just kind of walked walks away, it essentially interrupts you know, interrupts your whole performance. Now, I know it seems a little weird in doing that, but it's essentially what's going on here is it's Reginald Hargreaves showing up and then basically saying, your performance sucks. And because it seems to be the only real thing that Yanya has going for, and because it's coming from Reginald Hargreaves, who like the rest of them are all trying to prove themselves to him, even though he's basically dead, it's a personal assault. And so at that point, she just kind of abandons the entire performance and chases after Hargreaves, right? Quite literally, it's like Hargreaves is telling her like you were a disappointment when you were a child and you're an embarrassment as an adult like so you can play the violin big deal you can't possibly even destroy the world properly like face it Yanya like you're a complete and total failure kind of cutting past this this persona she puts on right with all this power and all that kind of stuff and basically cutting her on the most personal level it does the greatest amount of damage and so where you have number five who runs up on her and shoots her in the head it's not enough to kill her it's just enough to basically kind of knock her unconscious or at least seemingly you know, incapacitate her for a moment. And then of course, you basically find out that she was right when she said that it was Seance instead of Reginald Hargreaves, because it is just Seance pretending to be Reginald Hargreaves, at least enough of a distraction to where he can make her think that it really is Hargreaves himself. And so what you end up getting here is kind of a crazy thing is she says like, I mean, sure, like you guys defeated me, but the world's going to end. And when number five is like, what in the hell is that sound? She was like, I mean, at the end of the, at the end of the day, a failed performance still comes to an end. And what you're hearing is the finale that it is quite literally a meteor that's crashing into earth that was drawn to earth because of what it was that she'd done right sending out these kind of vibrational frequencies into space that basically deviated the path of an asteroid that's going to come crashing into the world and so one of the crazy things that happens here is that you end up basically getting seance who stops at deadness tracks now that leads us into the nature of seance's powers which is for the most part you're familiar with that already from the tv show where he can where he basically died came back to life he can communicate 
communicate with the dead, different things like that. What's established here at the end of the Apocalypse Suite is that he effectively has telekinesis, but that not even he knew that he had had telekinesis, right? It's one of those things that he just recently discovered. It's by him literally stopping this 40,000 ton piece of rock that the entirety of the earth is saved. And that's basically it, right? It's kind of this mind blowing moment of how this whole thing goes down. So we do get a kind of epilogue, a kind of explanation in terms of what's going on. But one of the things that I do want to talk about is the character of Ben. This is probably one of those things that a lot of you guys have been wondering, uh, you know, does Ben exist in the comics? Probably one of the first questions people ask, like, how come there's no discussion here about Ben? So horror does make an appearance later on, but in the first volume in Apocalypse Suite, we learn virtually nothing about him. The only thing we know is that he had died sometime before the events of the Apocalypse Suite had opened up, and that's essentially it, right? People blame uh, Luther for the death of Ben, but like, that's basically it because Luther was the leader of the team. But you'll notice here, there aren't really any instances of Seance talking to Ben, that Ben is just kind of like this disembodied voice that he can communicate with, which really really illustrates what he's capable of in terms of his powers and people in the afterlife. That's not really the case here. Uh, Ben's just basically gone and dead and out of the picture, and that's really it. The only real tie that we get to Ben in the living world is the android or the robot that Luther talks with, which is kind of the only real confidant he had while he was on the moon. And like, that was basically it, right? That's the only real involvement of Ben. But as far as this epilogue goes, the only thing we really know is that as far as rumor goes, because her vocal cords have been cut, seemingly she'll never be able to talk again um, that of course Ben, the robot, chimed in and told Luther, hey man, there's a meteor heading towards Earth. And he's like, yeah, we already know. We took care of it. That with Yanya herself, they were able to essentially save her life. Uh, but the bullets kind of left in her brain. They didn't want to take the risk on any nerve damage. Quite literally, it was a millimeter away from essentially killing her, taking away all of her function and everything. And so the result is that she'll probably never play the violin again. That uh, Detective Lupo, who had actually worked with Kraken, kind of a segment that we sort of skipped over. It wasn't overly important, but Detective Lupo was basically just a guy that Kraken and worked with where Kraken was more of like a Punisher-esque character and that Lupo would kind of feed, feed Kraken information, Kraken would feed Lupo information and that was basically it. But of course, Kraken fed Lupo information about the bust and so Lupo's the one who's able to, to arrest all the members of the orchestra, right? The, the Icarus Theater guys, those crazy folks. Um, but that's really kind of it, right? I mean, once they get back to the Umbrella Academy itself, they end up finding the entire place has just been destroyed by the, the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> <laughs> which has seemingly just been floating out in space for 20 some odd years and has just now crash landed back on Earth. But again, it's uh, the, the story is kind of an opening salvo, but there are some huge differences between the Netflix series and this series. So with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this to an end. We will do volume two. And that's when you'll see a lot more similarities, characters that you're familiar with, uh, but we'll do volume two tomorrow and I will catch you all later. Peace.